Amen. Thank you, Micah. Appreciate it. Great job. If you brought your Bibles with you, turn to Philippians chapter 3. Our passage this morning will be in Philippians chapter 3, and we'll be looking at verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1, that last little section there in chapter 3. And the title of the message this morning is Citizens of Heaven. Now we have, if you are interested, you can use the outline. I'll reference it in a few minutes. It's on the back of the bulletin. Uh, You can follow along that way if you prefer to, and uh, I'll give you the outline in a few moments. But uh, you can follow along that way. While you're turning there, on the screen is a place that is in Philippi today, and it's called the Acropolis. And I've been showing you pictures of different locations in Philippi, but I figured I'd shake things up a little bit. This is about as radical as I get. I put this picture earlier on and later. But what I want you to notice there is this is a modern day, of course, picture of the Acropolis. And in 42 BC, there was a battle that occurred there uh, that that occurred on the Acropolis. And when the battle was over, Philippi became a Roman colony. And as a result of that, the Roman, uh, the Roman colony became, of course, there at Philippi, those citizens became Roman citizens. They uh, it ended up having all of the rights and privileges of a Roman citizen, yet they did not live in Rome. Uh, they were a Roman colony, if you think about it, a commonwealth. They weren't there in the heart of Rome, yet they were citizens of Rome, and reflected and had all of the privileges that you could have if you lived in Rome as a citizen. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well that's interesting history, but what does that have to do with Christians? Well, for Christians it should relate and it should begin to ping a bell in our minds because you and I are ultimately citizens of heaven. We live here presently on the present earth, But we are to live, as we're going to see this morning, as citizens of our true location, our true citizenship. We are to reflect the values of being citizens of heaven. Yes, we currently live here on earth, but our ultimate citizenship is in heaven. And in a similar way to the Philippians who were in a place that wasn't in the center of Rome, yet they were still Roman citizens. And so this morning we're going to look at that, how we need to, as Christians, we need to live lives that reflect what our true citizenship is, which is in heaven, even though we are not presently there at this time. The outline for the message, like I said, it's on the back of the bulletin, and you can follow along that way, or you can take notes. But first we're going to see that As citizens of heaven, we need to follow Christ-like examples in verse 17. So we'll begin by looking at verse 17, following Christ-like examples. But then in verses 18 through 19, Paul includes not every example is good. Uh, In other words, as we read through this, Paul's going to say, look, there is a certain type of individual that we should be following after, but just as similar, there are individuals that we shouldn't follow after. So not every example that is out there in the world is one that we should follow. And finally, in verse 20 through chapter 4, verse 1, those last few verses, we're going to see why we need, need to live a certain way. And why is that? Because believers are citizens of heaven, and we need to reflect where our true citizenship is, and it's not here on the present earth. I don't know if you understand this, but you and I will not spend eternity on the present earth. So why would we reflect the values of the present earth? We need to go ahead and reflect where our eternal destiny is, which is in the new heavens and the new earth, where righteousness will dwell forever. What a beautiful picture one day, right? So let's read through our passage again. It's Philippians chapter 3, picking up from last week, verses 17 through chapter 4 and verse 1. Brethren, join in, fo- join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. <clears throat> 
whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exer- exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Now, if you've been with us for any time, you know that the book or the letter to the Philippians, this is sort of the structure that we've been looking at to follow along. We, we are at the end of chapter 3, and Lord willing, we'll begin chapter 4 and the last few messages next week. If you've been with us, you know that sort of at a high-level view, there is joy in seeing the Lord in our circumstances. God works all things to good, right, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. It's one thing to see the Lord when things are going well, but Paul is writing from where? Prison. And this is Paul's most joyous letter because he could see that the Lord was working good in that bad situation. In fact, he could see immediately that the Roman Praetorium guards had already heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And actually at the very end you'll see where some of them have even come to faith in Christ. Now we saw in chapter 2 that there's joy in serving the Lord. But there is a criteria you might say and that is Christ-like service, humility. Uh, There's no joy in serving the Lord with a frown, is there? That's not too joyful. But when we serve with a Christ-like attitude, we can have joy in our service. And as we finish up chapter 3, Paul's going to return a little bit to this particular subject, which is there is joy in, notice the word, avoiding legalism. Legalism robs you of the joy that you can have in Christ in your life and in service and so forth. Paul is going to actually return to that subject one last time, but he's going to show you the opposite extreme as well. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now next week, if you come back next week, we'll move into chapter 4. Chapter 4 is one of the most beautiful chapters. You know, as a pastor, you, you enjoy those types of chapters because he's going to show us how to have peace with God and of God. Do you have anxiety ever? Well, there's some help with that in that chapter. Do you find trouble being content with what the Lord has given you? Do you ever take time to thank God as He is the one who provides for our needs? I was listening to someone recently and they said needs, not greeds. And so we'll look at that over the last few weeks. But as Paul moves into this second half of the letter, Paul begins, you remember, with a warning. We're going to return to this idea in just a few moments. But Paul was warning, essentially, of the Judaizers of the day. And this is, you would think, well, what does this have to do with today? That was fine and dandy then. Well, Judaizers, basically what Judaizers were, if you remember, they were those who said, yes, it's good to believe in Jesus Christ, but you have to add something to it in order to have eternal life. What does that sound like? That sounds like salvation plus plus something. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that we have salvation through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. We aren't to add, in that case, circumcision. And Paul says, look, if there was anyone of Jewish background, if you will, who could boast in their past privileges and the things that they had, it was him circumcised on the eighth day, and so forth. He had all of his righteousness before he met Jesus Christ in doing something. He saw himself as righteous by what he did. When he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he changes from what? From that viewpoint to seeing all of his faith and all of his confidence, he gained Christ. Jesus, our Lord. Now, last week, though, if you were with us, you saw where Paul says, look, I'm not perfect. How many of us in here are perfect? Okay. Men, the only time you can use this maybe would be with your wives, you know, is to say, you're perfect, honey. But in all actuality, Paul says, look, I'm not perfect. 
but I'm progressing in Christ's likeness. So he goes from what I call an accountant who sees gain and loss, gain and loss. He sees himself as a runner running towards the goal, which is to be conformed into the image of Christ. He knows on the, in this life he won't. But he knows that one day he will. And that'll be what we look at today. But he says, in the meantime, don't look backwards, look forward. How many of us in our walk with the Lord, what we do is we turn around like a runner. Have you ever tried running around in a lap and then you look behind you, what happens? Paul says you will be prone to stumble. When you look back on your past certain sins or whatever the case is, you're more prone to sin and to more prone to stumble. And he says, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to look at, he's going to end with telling you in this chapter that you need to follow a particular type of example. Because many of us will follow people. I think with social media and all of the things we have today, we are prone to follow someone. But I'll tell you today, very clearly, Paul says, you cannot follow just anyone they need to have certain criteria in order to see whether or not we should follow them. So let's begin by looking at verse 17. Paul says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe others or those who walk according to the pattern you have seen in us. So Paul begins with the example of himself. Now, to avoid the idea that Paul is arrogant, what did he see, teach last week that we saw? He said, I'm not perfect, but what I'm doing is I recognize that I'll never be perfect in this life, but I'm not going to continue to stay that way. I'm going to work, if you will, work out my salvation, as he talks about in chapter 2. I'm going to do my part to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ. He knew he wasn't perfect, but he wasn't going to stay that way. He, he wasn't going to stay in that particular and so what he's saying is, though I am imperfect, I am growing in Christ's likeness. I see my deficiencies. And then I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to the passage there in 1 Corinthians. Because this is helpful here. 1 Corinthians 11.1. Because what you don't want to do is take this idea that Paul is this ivory tower theologian who says, I've got it all together. There is no such thing. Paul is imperfect. He knows that. But he doesn't want us to stay that way. You understand, as a pastor, that's the way I see it. I am not perfect. He who began a good work in Stephen, Philippians 1, 6, he won't complete it till the day of Christ. But that doesn't give us license to stay that way. I want you to look with me just real quickly in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. So what Paul is essentially saying, when we put these two together, when I'm acting in following Christ's likeness, follow me. Because my, if you will, what I'm looking to do is to take and form myself into the image of Christ. And so as I follow Christ, you can follow me. As I reflect Christ's likeness, follow my example. So Paul could say very clearly, look, you can follow me because I'm imperfect. I know that until the day of Jesus Christ, I will not be perfect. But in that in-between period of time, I'm being formed into the image of Christ. Those are the types of individuals we want to follow our lives after. Now, if you go back to Philippians 3.17, he says, join in following my example, but also others. And that's essentially what he says. And so he says there are other examples. Now, in chapter 2, there were two other examples, weren't they? Timothy and Epaphroditus, just to give you a contextual example. Timothy was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Epaphroditus was well. They showed examples of humility, Christ-like service. They were very similar to Paul. And they were trying to follow those examples. Now, Paul uses the word here, and observe those, so himself and others, if you want to state it that way, who walk. The word walk, whether it be in the Old Testament or the New Testament, has this idea, and basically what it does is it describes a life of both faithfulness, but also obedience to the Lord. He doesn't say, follow those who stand, but those who walk. This picture of walk is a daily lifestyle. Let me state it more clearly this way. 
You don't want to follow someone who says, you know, 20 years ago I reflected Jesus Christ on June 1st. I haven't since then. You don't want to follow someone like that, do we? We we don't want to follow someone like that. We want to follow someone who is daily walking with Jesus Christ. They have their high moments when they're walking in Christ's likeness. They have their shortcomings, and then they keep going. They just keep focusing on being formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Walking is obedience. It's faithfulness to the Lord and to His Word day in and day out. We don't want to follow someone who is faithful one time, two times, three times. We want someone who has their lifestyle where even though they have shortcomings, they are trying to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, in the bulletin, I mentioned that who are the three examples from the Old Testament who were seen as not perfect, but they walked in obedience and faithfulness to God. The three are, and I want you to read these sometime. The first is from, and these are all from Genesis. Noah, in chapter 6, verse 9, he's the first example in Genesis of those who walked as an example in what we would see obedience to the Lord in His Word. So the first example is Noah in Genesis 6, 9. And then Abraham, 24, 40. And then Isaac in 48, 15. So that's Genesis 6, 9. Genesis 24, 40, and Isaac is seen in 48, 15, and they are all seen with this word here, this idea of walking. Now, you'll know all three of them weren't perfect, were they? But they were those who continued to walk in obedience in a daily lifestyle. Yes, they fell short, just like all of us do at times, but they had, if you will, their eyes on faithfulness. But Paul, before we move on, says that you need to walk, in other words, walk, in other words, daily after the word there. And he uses the Greek word I have up there for you, and it means a, an impression, a stamp, or a model. So what he says here, brethren, join in following my example in the examples of others who daily have a pattern, or in other words, a model of Christ's likeness. They are modeling their lives and the, they want to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is there are examples for us to follow in our lives. And that example in the litmus test is are they individuals who desire to grow in the image of Jesus Christ? Or am I going to follow someone who isn't walking and wanting to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ? Proverbs 30, verse 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Solomon has it right, doesn't he? How many of us are trying to walk in the pattern of fools and then we're expecting good to come out of it? That's essentially what Solomon says. Solomon has his shortcomings, doesn't he? And we don't even have to be to digressing there. But in Proverbs there, he's contrasting there. Those who walk among fools, they suffer harm. How many of you have ever been around or spent a lot of time with someone who is a fool? In other words, they aren't walking in obedience to the Lord. They could care less about it. You will most likely, if you begin to pattern yourself after that, you will fall prey to the same types of things that they do. But the reverse, Solomon says, is the one who walks. Notice, those who walk with people that are wise, they will begin to pattern their lives after that. So let me ask you, in your life, who do you try to imitate? Who who do you see as an example or a pattern? Is it, as Solomon says, a fool who has no care for the obedience or faithfulness to the Lord? Or do you look to follow the one who is faithful and desires obedience to the Lord in His Word? But I want to flip this around a little bit too, and I want to ask you this. We have a lot of young folks that are in this church. For the older folks, this excludes myself, if they were to follow in our example, what would they find? Do you understand what I'm saying? Look, sometimes people will look to older Christians. They will look to older ones in the faith. And I want to ask you, if they were to follow you, would they find themselves following a fool? I'm including myself. Or someone who is wise and that uh, they seek to walk in the ways of the Lord. So this works both ways. It works as, am I following good Christ-like examples? 
if someone followed me, would they be walking in a similar pattern as Paul and so forth? So it works both ways. But not every example is good, is it? We have this idea today that every example is a good example and every example is perfect and it's okay who we follow. We can follow anyone. Paul is going to refute that idea because what we don't want to be is naive as Christians. We need to make sure that we test, like Bereans, who are people that we should not follow because not all people are people that we should follow. Look with me in verses 18 through 19. Paul is going to warn them again. This is the opposite end of the spectrum of the warning that he gave earlier in the chapter. Look with me. He says, for, that in Greek means because, he says, you need to walk in a certain pattern because many of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, and they set their mind on earthly things. Okay, what is he talking about? Well, in verse 18, again, in the Greek, it gives the idea, this is because you need to walk in the pattern of Christ-like examples, because there are many people out there that aren't walking that way. What is he talking about, though? So let's go back. Judaizers. I have that up there for you. He's not referring to Judaizers here. There's a soft allusion to it, sure. But he's not speaking of Judaizers. But I want to explain what the word antinomianism is. Because you're thinking, well, we don't have that today. Yes, we do. So Judaizers, if you think of a line, Judaizers are those who feel like salvation plus something. They're legalists. They add something to it. They believe in legalism. The other end of the spectrum would be a group of individuals that, if you have the word that is up there, I had it in the bulletin, it's called antinomian. And what is that? That would be a person who would sit there and effectively say, yeah, Paul, that's great. We don't have to walk in obedience to the law. We can eat, drink, and be merry and do whatever we want. Grace will abound and cover that sin. This is the other end of the spectrum. This is someone who says, I can live any way that I want to because the grace of God will cover it. I can sin and I can live in life of all kinds of unrighteousness and God will cover that sin. Amen, Paul. We can live any way we want to. You know, Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit because he's basically negating both ideas. The in-between is what we do. We walk in godliness according to the scriptures, but we aren't saved by that. It's somewhat paradoxical. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1, because if you ever have someone who says, Look, I can live any way that I want to, and so can you. Well, Romans chapter 6 would say, no, that's not true. Yes, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. But how are we to live our lives? Are we just supposed to continue to sin because God will cover that sin? Romans chapter 6, and uh, if you want to learn more about this, like I said, if you want to read the remainder of the chapter, he deals with this uh, in in a lot more detail than I have time to this morning. But just in verses 1 and 2, you get the idea. Romans chapter 6, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall... We who died to sin still live in it. And he spends the majority of the rest of the chapter saying, we as believers in Jesus Christ are not supposed to walk in unrighteousness. We are not supposed to walk in sin. We aren't supposed to walk in the ways of the world. We are supposed to be different. Yes, salvation is by grace through faith, and nothing you can do can add to that. But you aren't supposed to live a life of unrighteousness, a life that is unworthy of what Jesus Christ has called. Many people, even today, will fall into one of those two extremes, won't they? They'll say, salvation is by works because, yes, Christ died on the cross, but you must do something. You know what that is? You must do whatever I decide is that something. It's salvation plus something equals eternal life, and that is not what the Bible says. Eternal life is salvation plus nothing because Christ has paid the debt. 
But on the other end of the extreme, you have people today who would say, I can live, eat, drink, be merry, and do whatever I want all week long, and I can sin and have a life of unrighteousness because God will basically bless me and, and forgive that sin, and we aren't supposed to live that way. I would call it this way. Solomon warns of extremes, and this is one of those times you have to avoid the extreme because both extremes are wrong. Beloved, you and I, myself... We are saved by grace through faith, but we are not to live a life of unrighteousness. Do you know why so many people think the church is hypocritical? Because it is because we live no differently than those who have never come to faith in Jesus Christ often. And so they don't see the difference in us. What does Paul say? Perfect? No. Being formed into the image of Jesus Christ? Yes. Each single day. Now, what do these people that he refers to, this would be sort of the idea, we would call it today uh, antinomianism, but back in Philippians you'll see the description of what some of these people reflect here, and we'll go through these four. First he says their end is destruction. This is an annihilation. The Bible doesn't speak of annihilation. When someone dies, they go either to the presence of the Lord or they go to Hades, which is the abode waiting to appear before the great white throne judgment. He doesn't speak here of annihilation. The idea is separation from God's presence. Now, some people say, well, what if they were believers? Well, if they were, for some reason, these are people that will lose out at the Bema seat. But basically what he speaks of here is that it is destruction. It's, it's not annihilation. It is separation from God. Do you know that you will spend eternity in a conscious state of existence forever and ever? And when that forever is almost done, it'll be a for another ever. It will never end. And it'll be two options for humanity. It is either eternal separation from a holy and righteous God, or it'll be forever in His presence. Amen. And the only option is through the Via Del Rosa. You have to go down the way of Calvary. You have to see Jesus Christ and all of His majesty. Two, he says, their God is their belly. This means that they desire and have an unhealthy physical desire uh, for things, of course, physical. They desire physical type things. The third one is they glory in their shame. In other words, they take pride in things that we should be ashamed of. Read 1 Corinthians and you'll see some of the vile things that those individuals believed in. But here in Philippians, Paul says that these are individuals that glory or pride themselves in things that they should, should be shamed in. Are there things that you would be ashamed of before the presence of the church? I'm sure there would be. And that's sort of the idea here, that these people prided though themselves on things that we should be embarrassed if we did. Fourth, you'll notice here, they think on earthly things. Their minds are not saturated in Jesus Christ. They are wrapped up and consumed in the things of this world. Colossians 3, 1 says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Set your mind on the things above and not the things that are on the earth. And so again, what Paul says is, he says there are two types of examples. You either walk and follow those examples that are Christ-like examples, those that are being formed into the image of Jesus Christ, but you need to stay away from these other types of examples. And you know why? You cannot grow in the image of Jesus Christ saturated in sin every day. You have to begin to be formed into the image of Christ. And so let me ask you, you say, what is the litmus test we would say today in our vernacular for whether or not I should follow someone? And I mainly target this towards our young folks. And it's very simply this. Do they match the examples in chapter 2 of Philippians? If they don't, don't follow them. It's that simple. Beloved, if our generation grows up in the worldliness and the things that they have offered before them today, they will not grow into the image of Jesus Christ. You cannot grow into the image of Jesus Christ if you follow worldly examples, because why? Well, you'll notice now why he brings this in. Look in verses 20 and 21. 
Because he uses the word there again, for. Now, I keep repeating this over and over. When you think of the word for in the Greek, in the New Testament, most often he's, what they're saying is because. He's saying, I'm getting ready to describe something because of what I just told you. In other words, state it this way. Because there are people that you should not follow and that follow lives filled with sin, you should not follow that example. Why? And he says why. Notice, because you're a citizen of heaven. Notice, you shouldn't follow earthly, worldly, fleshly 18 and 19 because ultimately your citizenship is in heaven. So now we go back to the Acropolis War in 42 B.C. When the, Roman, well, when the Romans, and they had the war there, and they overcame, and that Philippi became a Roman colony, those citizens did not transplant themselves to Rome, did they? No, they still lived there in Philippi. They were a Roman colony, and they were to act as Roman citizens. That's the same idea of what Paul is pulling right here. He says, you might be citizens of Philippi in the temporary, but for eternity you are going to be a citizen of heaven and you need to reflect it now, not then. Notice what he says. He says our citizenship, it means a commonwealth. If you ever heard that expression, that's where we get the expression for that. It means a colony of foreigners. Why would that be a colony of foreigners? Well, they're really Roman citizens. They just don't live there. You're really a citizen of where if you've trusted in Christ? Well, it's no offense. It's not Michigan. Your citizenship is in heaven, right? We live here in Michigan temporarily, but one day you will spend eternity in the new heavens and the new earth, and you need to reflect your true home. So often, what do we reflect? We reflect the world more than we do Christ Jesus. Yes, we're supposed to be good citizens. We are. The Bible teaches that Christians, I think, should be the best citizens. But ultimately, we are citizens of heaven. I think what happens sometimes is we get so engulfed in the world, and we think, well, this is where we're going to stay forever, beloved you will not spend eternity listening to me preach. Amen? And for those of you that snarkily laughed, you probably will. <laughs> on one of the streets of silver, I probably won't be on the street of gold. But you'll notice as we go back to it, he says, because you're a citizen of heaven, you should reflect that. But notice what, they, what he goes on here. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you wait on Jesus to come back? Or do you say, you know, you could wait a little bit longer because I have my whole life ahead of me. Or I have this I want to do this week. Could you just wait a little bit longer? You notice here he says they eagerly await. The reason why I emphasize that is do you desire the Lord's return? Do you know how differently we would live if we knew Jesus was coming back this week for the bride of Christ? You would be so unconcerned about so many different things that we get engulfed in, right? And I think the church, by and large today, I don't know if we eagerly await it. But if you knew some of the things that came with it and that were subsequent to it, I do think we would long and we would wait for it. Notice what he says. He's going to give us a little bit of an example of what waits us in the future if we are in Christ. Notice what he says, that Jesus is coming, the one in which we're longing for, we're looking for. He's going to transform us, metamorphosis, our humble bodies. Now, stop for a second. He's not condescending the human body in its present state. What is he saying? He says that these bodies are susceptible to sin, illness, and death. Can you imagine living in a life where there's no illness? There's no death? Revelation chapter 21 says that there will be a day where there is no more funeral homes, no more funerals. Stephen will never have to preach and teach another funeral message again. And that might be pleasing to you, but I want you to think for a second that one day there's going to be a whole lot of no mores, isn't there, for those in Jesus Christ. Why would we not eagerly await him to come and to begin bringing forth all of those things? Of course, sin and death is what we typically think about and the aging of the body. And I'm sure none of you have that problem today where you have aches and pains and you'd like those cured. But I want to draw your attention, though, to the one I did leave off to the end, which is sin. 
because I think this is the one we probably gloss over because we like the idea of no more funerals for Stephen to preach, right? Everybody can get behind that and say, hey, man, we won't have to listen to him anymore doing that. We won't have any more funeral homes. Can you imagine there will be no funeral homes? Because no one will die. The body will be prepared for eternity, but you will not have the capacity to sin. That seems just unimaginable to me. We will not have even the capacity to sin. We will not think, act, or ever be sinful again. And so he's going to conform us, and then we will be like him. I want you to look with me in 1 John before we finish up. Turn with me to 1 John. And I taught on 2 John, so the trick is to turn to that one and then go to the one before it, 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. And you begin to see that the ultimate author of the Scripture is God Almighty Himself. 1 John 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him. We won't be Him. We will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. One day you and I will be like Christ. In other words, the point is we will be formed into the image of Christ. We will have glorified bodies. We will be like Him. We will have similarities. We will have bodies that were made for eternity. And this brings us to, of course, the teaching on the rapture and the resurrection because this is what this teaches us. Now, I put up there two passages. The rapture passage, if you want to read it sometime, we just studied this on Wednesday night, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We're just going to read a few verses before we finish. Because I want you to see this because Paul speaks of this same idea in Philippians in 1 Corinthians 15. He speaks about the changing of the body which happens, will happen at the rapture. And you can read about that in 1 Thessalonians 4. But I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 51 and 53. And when he uses the word sleep, this is a euphemism for death. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. And I gave you the whole passage there. But what we can be sure of is this. That one day Jesus Christ will return. The rapture will happen. The resurrection will happen just as it's described. And we will be like Christ. We will be finally formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Remember, first chapter, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will complete it when? On the day of Jesus Christ. And Christ will form us into that image. And you ask yourself, well, how do you know, Stephen, that that will happen? Well, actually, because of what Paul says at the end of verse 21, because of the power that he has to subject all things to himself. Let me state it this way. If Jesus Christ can subject all things to his will and his power and his sovereignty, all things means all things. That means every government, every president, every king, every everything will be subject to the majesty of Jesus Christ. If he can create all things, sustain all things, and govern and rule all things, do you think he has any problem with transforming the body of something he's already created? No. He has no power that he cannot of course, do what he needs to do. And he says, therefore, in verse 1, to stand firm until he comes. Maranatha, our Lord, come. So as Christians, our citizenship ultimately is where? We are to live lives that reflect what? Earthly values or heavenly values? And so Paul tells us that we need to reflect where our true citizenship is, which is in heaven. 1 John 2, 28 says, Now little children abide in me so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. It is indeed truth. Father, we thank you that...
Lord, there are examples in our lives. There are good and there are bad examples, Lord. And I pray that, as Paul says, we would look to have those who we follow, and I pray this especially for our young folks, that they follow those who desire to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ, not formed into the ways of the world. And Father, that we would do so because we are ultimately citizens of heaven. Father, I pray that as we go out into this world, we will live lives that reflect